about 200 men or something, and we got on these planes. I was in num plane number one, and uh, everybody was excited, didn't know where we were going. We got at the end of the runway, and they gunned the engines and gunned them, and nothing happened. They pulled us on the side, and the other two took off. So we didn't, they took us back in school buses and guarded barracks that we wouldn't run away, I guess. And uh, the next day we took off. And it was bad and stormy. And we're flying real close to the ocean. You see the white caps about 1,200 feet or something. We landed at Newfoundland. And then from Newfoundland, uh, we just kept going for another 10 hours or something. And finally landed. And... Uh, a lot of the fellows were going up and down were sick in the stomach, and it was about 12 of us that weren't sick. We, uh, inside the plane, they had like bucket seats all around, and in the center of the plane, they had all kind of, a uh, lot of bicycles. We didn't understand why they had bicycles. They were taking them over to Europe, and I guess that was for paratroopers or somebody were going to use them over there. Anyway, when uh, we got up there, they took us on a school bus down in this rocky field and there was a captain standing up on top of the back of a truck and he says, welcome to Iceland. Iceland? <laughs> we didn't know where we were going. Uh, one of the uh, fellow's uh, orders was open like and he took a peek during the flight and he said, we're going to Indigo. I guess that was a code word for Iceland. So that's all we knew. We thought we was going to go to India or someplace. So he says, Iceland? And all we've seen out there was rocks. There's rock, rocks all over the place. It's a big rock pile in Iceland. And um, that's how we got to Iceland. And then he says, uh, I understand they made a big mistake. He says, uh, I ordered uh, Air Corps engineers to help build the base up, to build the Quonset huts for the uh, planes coming in. You get 40, 50 planes landing a day and you have to have room for the crews to sleep. And he says, I wanted somebody to come up here and build the Quonson huts. They only had a handful of CBs. So, uh, and he says, but I understand you people are all uh, specialists in your own field. There was fighter uh, plane mechanics, uh, bomber mechanics, and uh, supply mechanics, and electricians, and carpenters, and... Uh, so he says, what we're going to have to do is go through your records and see what you did in civilian life and how you can fit into our base up here and what we can do with you, you know. And uh, then they put us in uh, some crowded uh, barracks to sleep overnight. Not barracks, they're Quonset huts. And uh, he says, we'll check your Army records and your civilian life and see what you did. Maybe we can fit you where you were. If you use a truck driver, we'll make a truck driver out of you. If you worked in the kitchen, we'll make a cook out of you. And uh, if you worked with the medics or something like that, you was interested. And they were going to try to place everybody from these 200 and some men. And uh, I, uh, they gave us two weeks to work on a line, two weeks to work general labor, help build the roads and everything, clear the stones off. And then they give you uh, two weeks uh, working uh, wherever they want you to work, general labor or what. So the first two weeks I was working down on the, uh, down at the air base, loading planes up with gasoline. And uh, <laughs> one of the first stories, uh, I was up on top, this, uh, on the wing of a B-17 or B-24, I forgot which one. And I had the nozzle inside of the uh, inside of the plane to go in the tank. And the fellows that were p pumping the gas from the truck, they pumped too hard or something. And when they had the nozzle in there, it wasn't all the way in or something. And the gasoline was shooting out all over. And I'm hollering, ho, ho, ho. He's loaded. And, <laughs> and then a pilot standing on the ground says, loaded hell. He says, I didn't think I flew across the ocean. <laughs> he said, those things are empty. So they finally decided that pump gasoline slower, and uh, we got the planes loaded. So I worked two weeks over there. Then another two weeks I worked at the uh, CBs building these Quonset huts for the plane, these other people coming in every day, you know, and they had to have a place to sleep before they went on to England. And uh, then I had two weeks general labor uh, 
help build a roadway through the camp. It was only one roadway, but we had to pull stones off to the side, like. And uh, I think it was an Easter Sunday uh, back 1943. It was a real nice day, one of the warmest days they said they had in Iceland. We never had a thermometer up there, but somebody said it was around 70 or something. So about five or six of us decided to uh, take a walk off the air base, head towards the ocean like just to see what's out there. So we did that. We walked out there and there was some hulls of broken ships and smashed ships. And there was a couple little houses out there, fishermen or something, Icelandic fishermen. Then we, uh, we stayed there for a while and then we came back up on the base. And I wrote a letter. Uh, my brother had uh, 16 years old. He had like uh, infantile paralysis. And I know that he liked uh, mail. So I used to write to him every day. So I told him what we seen. I says, you know, we were not on the beach. And I says, but you know what? I said, I didn't see any gun emplacements, no protection around this air base at all. I says, uh, the Germans can come up here, and the submarines get on the rubber rafts, walk up to our air base, blow up our tanks and our water tower and on the tower and everything else. And then while well, we're running around, didn't know what was going on, they can walk slowly back to the to the beach, get into rubber rafts, go out to the submarines and take off. And uh, like a bunch of terrorists, you know. And uh, anyway, I wrote that to my kid brother. And the next day, uh, they called me in. And I can, we only had five officers up there. And they read the letter and they said, you write that letter? And I said, yeah. And I said, it's the truth. And they said, we shouldn't do that because if the Germans ever got a hold of the letter, I said, well, we'd be in deep trouble. If they don't know what's not up here, what we don't have, they don't have to know, you know. And, uh, but right after that, though, they start building uh, gun torts around the air base and uh, taking, like, twin 50s and putting them in these turrets. And everybody was assigned to a turret to help out in case something would happen. The Germans would land up there. We'd have to run to these turrets and trying to stop them. So I thought I was going to get court-martialed when they read that letter. Oh, well, because I told them when you only had five officers and everybody didn't get along with them. And I said, if we were invaded, I said, they'd probably all be shot in the back <laughs> from the men, not from the front, from the enemy coming in. So uh, I thought they were going to court-martial me for doing that or something. And then another day I was on, in the, on the kitchen duty or something, and uh, a corporal came over with the mess cook and asked for me, and he said, go with him. I said, uh oh, this is it. And I went, and they took me to uh, the headquarters. And uh, somebody was interviewing me up there. And then they said, well, you had uh, a year and a half of college. And he said, you got, uh, you says you type, and you can take shorthand. And... and uh, I said, well, I don't know about the shorthand. I said, I can type, though. And so he said, well, we're going to open up a, a special service office. And he says, um, would you like to work in there? I didn't even know what it was, you know. And then the lieutenant was telling me what it was all about. And he says, go down to hut number 26 or something and pick up a typewriter and bring it up to uh, so-and-so building up here, and we're going to open up this office. And that's where I got in the special service and inside this big Quonset hut, another sergeant and myself, they had, uh, I don't know where we got big maps, like three by three square, and pasted them all around inside this Quonset huts. And then I started putting pins with the front, fronts were, and the generals and the opposing generals, and uh, how the lines moved. And then what I used to do... Uh, I'd listen to the radio, I think it was Lord Ha Ha, the Englishman who turned German or something, and he broadcast from Berlin every morning. And I'd write everything down that he said, like we shot down 125 planes and the Americans, they missed their target and they bombed civilians and they killed a bunch of people. And uh, so I take everything and they lost, you know, 100 some planes or something. And then... Uh, Nine o'clock in the morning or right after that, I listened to a station from London, 
and they'd talk about the same raid. The Americans pulled a big raid over Hamburg or something, and they lost 35 planes. Then uh, by 10 o'clock, I got a uh, station from someplace in New Hampshire, and I got the news what the Americans would say. And they would always say that they pulled a big raid, and they, 25 planes were unaccounted for. So my boss, Lieutenant Rubin, he'd say, how do you get where they shot all these people, all these planes down? So I told him, well, I'd take what the Germans says, what the British said, and what the Americans would say. I added them up and divided by three. <laughs> when I typed this news up, and I used to give the news before the movies at night, at seven o'clock, pull the card table up on the stage, and I get all the news from all the fronts, the Russian front, the Eastern front, the uh, Admiral Halsey, what's going on over there in the Navy and the ships. And uh, I used to give the news. And so we did this every night. And then like once a month, we would, uh, I used to draw maps of all the different fronts and uh, get down in front. We, I don't know what they call this machine where you can shoot pictures up on a screen. And I had an arrow and then I type out what my buddy's supposed to say, and he would be reading the news up there and say, like General Mark Clark is going this way, and I had the arrow down there pointing up like where he's going up to what city or, or whatever they took in the Battle of the Bulge, what happened over there, so everybody can see what was going on. But on the news, I used to type up uh, the news every day. I think I made seven copies and jump in the jeep and took one down into the hospital. One to the officers' club, one to the men's club, and uh, one to the uh, going inside the uh, mess hall. So you're standing in line, you can read the news, what's going on. Because otherwise, people didn't have any radios up there, and we didn't know what was going on. It, you know, a lot of the fellows knew there was a war going on, but they didn't know anything what what happened or where, who took what, or the march across Africa, stuff like that. But they used to come up into the special service office, and uh, I can tell them, you know, show them just where the different fronts and what they did and where they were bombing over in Italy, and Bulgaria, Ploys, the oil fields or whatever, you know. And it was a real good, interesting job, you know, trying to keep uh, everybody happy and know what's going on.